You live, Your Worship. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, Council, I'd like to uh, start this Committee of the Whole for February 14th, 2023. The uh, day is Valentine's Day and uh, Councillor Cherry's birthday. As you can see by the balloons, that uh, <laughs> it's like Winnie the Pooh, right? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I'd like to call this uh, meeting to order with adoption of the agenda. Someone want to make that motion for me, Councillor Orlando, seconded by Councillor Cherry. All in favor? Motions carried. Adoption of the minutes. We there aren't any, so we're moving right on to item six: uh, delegations and presentations. So we have a presentation from RMR, and uh, gentlemen, we'll turn it over to you. Uh, Your Worship. Yes. Um, I have a declaration of conflict of interest, so I'm going to recuse myself from the room related to an ongoing business relationship with uh, RMR. All right, thank you. Here. Yeah. How does the slides work? Hello, everybody. How are you, Peter? I'm good, thanks, Peter Nelson. I think we all know each other. Um, so, well, first of all, I just want to thank everyone for taking some time to um, sit down or sit down and go through a few few things and listen to uh, some of our. Uh, Plans and uh, how we how we view the, the immediate future here. Um, question, technical question: Do I just ask for the slide to move, or do I move it on here? You just ask. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure that I'm technically right. So, um, really appreciate the time. Uh, myself and Jason are going to kind of split through and run through the presentation. The intention behind this isn't really to be a full presentation. If, uh, you know, as far as uh, we just stand up here and talk to you. Uh, definitely would like to interact. So if you have questions, you have comments, you have anything you want to you know, interject with, please feel free. Uh, it's really, really kind of a basis for a discussion. So uh, next slide. Um, so I thought I'd start a little bit with just about the history of uh, Mount McKenzie and how it ended up uh, in its current state. Um, and then slide through some of the, some of the history of the, of the plants for the resort, et cetera. Um, you know, as everyone probably knows, uh, skiing has been prevalent in Royal Stokes pretty much since the beginning of Royal Stokes. So, you know, it's the oldest known ski club in North America. Um, it's got a very rich, deep history. Um, that timeline kind of goes through the history of what how skiing developed here. You know, um, Mount Mackenzie as early as uh, the 40s has had skiing on it and um, went through various iterations over the next 50 years or 40 years uh, of ownership from uh, independent owners, uh, and eventually in 1983, uh, the, it went bankrupt and the city stepped in and took it over. Um, uh, I think while was with the intention at that time to find someone to develop it and really started to pursue that over time. And in 1999, um, uh, and I, I mean, obviously I wasn't here in the 80s and 90s, but uh, you know, my understanding is in the, you know, through the 90s, the city and local businesses were really keen to find um, outside investors to develop a project um, you know, we're, we're really looking towards a world class ski project um, right in at the foot of uh, the town of Revelstoke. In 1999, um, investors were found. So, the original developers of the resort um, engaged. And um, in 2003, started moving towards uh, an NDA proposal. And in 2005, that NDA province was signed. Um, and then two years later, uh, a lot of, after a fury of activity of lists and infrastructure getting put in, um, Revelstoke Mountain Resort opened, um, <clears throat> not quite as it is today, but with uh, about half the lists that uh, uh, in 2007, with the completion of Lower Gondola and uh, River Chair in 2000 for 2008 season. Uh, next slide. Um, maybe jump to the, these are kind of the wrong order. So if we go to the next slide one more time, and I'll come back to that one. Um, so what I wanted to talk about was our immediate future non mountain planning. Um, so we are, you know, we've been working, you know, originally there's the, the master, the original master plan as far as lifting lift, uh, locations actually has about 20 lifts on it. Um, we've identified these as our priority lifts in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, and the focus really is on five lifts. Um, so there's, I'll, I'll point that out. So there's, Three, six, 15, 13, and 18. Um, our, the three lift system here um, is really about um, three things uh, uphill capacity, uh, redundancy, and capacity out of the village, and uh, some train expansion. 
Um, so our priority is actually 15. So that's the lift, uh, this one here that takes, um, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll again kind of step up the level of brand recognition for Revelstoke as we climb our uh, vertical drop from 5,600 to so over 6,000 feet. Um, basically goes to the top of Sub Peak. If you're familiar with that, uh, very long, very big lift. It expands our terrain by over 300 acres. Um, and we'll give you access basically to the whole mountain right from the top. Uh, so in the ski business, this is a spectacular lift. This will be, this will be um, uh, regaled amongst the skiing community. Um, and we're super excited about that being a priority. Um, it's, and um, <clears throat> along with that lift, the six and three that come down the base, the six is a lift that is over some of probably the best blue skiing terrain in the mountain. Um, and, and um, it also provides connection to 15, and three is that connector lift that'll take you out of the village. So once we, we really wanna build the three lifts in a row um, as from top to bottom, um, essentially doubling the capacity of what we currently have coming out of the village um, and kind of future-proofing us for quite some time for development and be able to, to, to provide a great experience for folks. So. Um, lifts and development of beds and access and visitation have to be in balance. Um, otherwise, you end up with things like massive lineups and dissatisfied people and poor experiences. And we want to, with our lift system, stay ahead of that development and make sure that we're always providing an excellent, world class experience on them. Um, 13 and 18 would come later, and they're really about accessing new terrain in different zones. Um, and, uh, but our priority are those the first three. Um, just to give some context, the you know, working budget for those three lifts is just under $60 million. Um, our other developments on mountain that are priority, uh, the major one is uh, a gondola top, or a gondola top lodge right here. So a large food and beverage facility to facilitate uh, basically more seating and a better zone for, for skiers. Um, and then we also have in our short term priority to develop snowmaking from here to here. Um, and then between those two projects, that's about 20 to $25 million. Um, snowmaking, as we've operated and really been tracking uh, snow levels at all elevations, we've noted the, the, the dependable, what we call the dependable snow line, um, has been slowly inching up year after year. Um, so we've, we've got snowmaking to about here right now. But the dependable snow lines kind of right about here, and that we we're anticipating it to continue to to to, to creep. Um, hence, we need to make a, a significant investment to, to ensure con connectivity from top to bottom of the resort. Um, maybe go back to that previous slide if you don't mind. So this will look like on. So these are um, three priority lists and what they will look like on our new trail map. Kind of gives you a bit of a different angle. Look at it uh, again. Three, six, fifteen. And then that boundary zone actually comes out like this, snowmaking in that zone. Yeah. Um, questions, comments? Any questions, Kevin? Just from a skier's point of view, are you extending the boundary past what's commonly called catcher's mid or that fire line there? Uh, the boundary will go right to that zone. Awesome. So uh, the plan is to develop a road basically on that line. Uh, I'm sorry, right above it. Yeah, there's a better angle uh, we found to put a properly a road to properly maintain like a, a true cat track and actually extend. We call that uh, that zone overstoke. Gotcha. And we'd extend jalapeno, uh, extend, extend hot sauce, and then glade the whole area. There's about 200 acres of skiable terrain there. Okay, will this put Montana Bowl into the zone or just south? Um, not in bounds, okay. but excessive, it would be pretty easy to access. Awesome. They'll have glide to probably about a seven minute hike, 10 minute hike maybe. So <laughs> potentially, there's a potential to bring it in bounds just like a control or a controlled uh, backcountry zone. Uh, it's kind of, we're kicking around how that would work, but uh, potentially actually just controlling the whole zone We call it a backcountry experience that doesn't need a guide. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Anything else? Uh, that's, that's great. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, but obviously all, we're all here to kind of talk about that. This is the, you know, that on-hill investment that facilitates um, and allows and earns us bed rates, et cetera, in the base areas. Um, so our plans are to continue to invest ahead of 
well, well, well ahead of what that means to our wind. Um, but again, to ensure that we are uh, keeping our, you know, our renowned resort on the map as a world class experience. So, thanks for your time, and I'll hand over to Jason now. Thanks, Peter. We go a couple slides ahead. One more, yeah. So, uh, everybody, I'm Jason Kelder. I think most everyone knows me. I also wanted to introduce uh, Bill Hunter and uh, Kelly Northcott with the Mountain Resorts branch. Actually, can we back up one slide, please? All of the Yeah. No. <laughs> this is a this is a little less fun as than the, the skiing discussion. This is down into the village planning and policy uh, discussion. And and thanks again uh, for for uh, having us here today. We. Uh, We've got a piece of uh, zoning bylaw housekeeping in front of council we received first reading for prior to the election. And one of the requirements of our first reading was for the resort to come back to council and, and present on that. But we thought we'd take this opportunity to also do a deeper dive on Revelstoke, some of our some of the history, but also some of the, the current thinking and uh, and re-engage uh, the, the mountain resorts branch. Because between the, 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 the local government and the community uh, the staff representing the, the, the local community, we've got the province represented by the BC Mountain Resorts branch and a developer, um, all sort of as major stakeholders in, in the future of the resort here in Revelstoke. So uh, when, we, when we talk about planning and we talk about investments on, on crown land, investments on private land, commitments that the province is able to uh, demand of a developer that, that a local government can't as easily do things like mandatory affordable housing, things like that. Um, it's good to have all the players in the room and, and, and do that. Um, I wanted to start a little bit with the history. Um, this is a, a land plan. This is a picture represented by policy um, prior to uh, annexation. So as you can sort of see from here, um, this is Arrow Heights. This is the current Mackenzie Village uh, development. You can see very sparse development along the edge of, uh, of, of the city boundary at the time. And then the, the development sort of going to the south with a very dense village and then essentially development sprawling all over the mountain. Um, and that was that was a, the, 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 the basis for, for original sort of bank account entitlement ideas. When we talk about spending tens and hundreds of millions of dollars in in in, in infrastructure on public land, the, the typical uh, um, sort of push and pull of that is 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 development for market opportunity in the same proximity. And Bill and Kelly can probably expand a little bit better on that a little bit later. But I thought we'd start here. Um, next slide, please, Jaylene. So this is a, a bit of a planning update uh, that was done in 2019, 2020. Um, and it, it sort of constrains itself to lands that, that are controlled by the developer at the time. Uh, and also a little bit more reflective of the zoning bylaw in, in force today. So essentially it doesn't really show it very well, but development, small development pod here down in the lower lands this land's not owned by, by the resort. This area is all pretty much golf, super high dense village, some, and then some sprawling development up, up the hillsides. Um, and so that's, this is sort of a, a bit of a review and, a, and this is what happens when you have a policy as it relates to land, you start to get more information and in. geotechnical environmental concerns are probably the biggest ones. And then after that, there's civil. Uh, where you can get water pressure, where you can get sanitary, those sorts of things. And then so your, your picture evolves over time and that continues all the way to build out. Uh, next slide, please. So in, in 2022, 2023, we started looking at the lands a little bit less constrained by the zoning table that we that, that were contemplating second reading in the, in the upcoming council meeting and said, okay, if we didn't have if we followed the intent of the original master development agreement, the original master planning document and the text within the OCP, what would we do with the land that's maybe a little different? Um, and we, we, we engaged a, a, a world-class planning firm out of the US. It's done a lot of these mountain communities as well as lots of work in, in Canada, including other areas in BC. And, uh, and we sort of had another look at the land. Um, and what we've done, is we've really identified, we've got a, a parcel of land down in the bottom 
This is lower elevation. There's a quite a steep embankment here as you climb up towards the uh, the elementary school. This area really sort of associates itself more with Revelstoke proper and 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 Arrow Heights. And then we've got sort of this long bench that sort of follows through here, and there's an escarpment that follows this line. Um, and this is the outflow of Williamson Lake. So there's a bit of a ravine through here. Um, so you know maybe what makes sense there. And uh, I know Mackenzie Village is in here, but if you if you eliminate you know, Mackenzie Village, what does the area feel like in general and how do we fit in? Um, and then we've got the golf parcel and then we've got some concepts for the village. Um, and then the other stuff that's up on the mountain, we kind of left out is, is saying that, that requires a lot of looking. Uh, we have to, you know, landslide specialists, geotechnical specialists, hydrologists and environmental scientists need to be involved with those kind of discussions because all those plans that you saw before aren't vetted through those lenses. Right. They're just, hey, we looked at a topographical map and we can put a road here. So, and that's that's sort of how initial land planning starts typically is usually, can we get access? Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, we put this slide together um, to basically identify and communicate uh, lands in and around the CD8 zone controlled by the developer. Um, the stuff in blue is lands that RMR has 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 either title to or some sort of control over. Uh, the land in yellow is owned by JS Park, a uh, private individual, uh, lives in Korea, and we have a current contract uh, to purchase that land, potentially. Um, so we're looking at that from a planning perspective. You saw the last slide, there was land planning over that land. Um, so that's 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 something we're looking at to try and bring the parcel to be a little bit more cohesive, if you will. There are other future lands that can be taken taken down from the crown as a as a compensation for the up mountain investments. The lands you saw up on the hillsides, lands out to the south, lands at mid mountain or not mid mountain at, at Revelation elevation. Um, they're all identified as part of the mountain uh, sort of the master development agreement that um, once investments are made, there's a phasing table, there's a calculation uh, associated with that, the Mountain Resource Branch audits that, and then there's a price that, that's preset in the, uh, in the agreement and in the policy with the province for the developer to buy that land. And then those entitlements, those bed units get transferred to that land. Um, one thing we wanted to point out um, is Williamson Lake, there's been a lot of, I've, I've worked with the resort for about a year now, looking after the land and the development side. And I've heard a lot in town around Williamson Lake and uh, how important it is to the community and how, um, and, but also there's, there seems to be a little bit of a misconception around, around lakeshore ownership and control. And so this map, I hope, will, will sort of further identify what, 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 the, what the land ownership around the lake really is. So this is the city park. This is the RV park. There's the beach. Um, this parcel was subdivided and uh, turned over to the city as part of the master parks agreement. This is a city park already. This, this piece of land is subdivided, but not transferred title yet to the city. It's pending, it's because of some litigation that named both the city and the developer with an injury on the lake. I think most people are familiar with that, but the agreement to, to, to title that, that's been, the, the plan has been posted by a BC legal surveyor, it's just pending some some legal administration. Um, the other the other thing. So as we go through this process with the with with Williamson Lake, Williamson Lake has has a couple of different values in, in, in the city. It's got a recreational uh, value, but it also has an environmental value. So the putting the the the, the land surrounding the lake in the city's hands guarantees protection for whichever, however the city wants to create a hierarchy of those values. If you want to create lakeshore trails, or if you want to keep people out of an area, it's no longer a, you know, a private interest that, that, that deals with that in, in large part. The, the last piece that RMR still controls is just to the, to the north of the city owned parcel. But uh, this year we extended the, the, the road right away, all the way to the lake essentially. And we have an agreement in principle for a trail along the lakeshore that's being used by the public today. 
So as we move forward with formalizing our plans down in that area, that is one of those sort of pedestrian connections that we would formalize through that detailed planning. And, and as when we submit a subdivision plan or development permit application to the city, we would have to honor those uh, principles within the OCP for, for multimodal transport and, and whatnot through, through these lands and, and all of the lands, honestly. Um, yeah, and that's another thing we can sort of talk about. We, like, we, we, we put this together as a discussion guidance document. We could put all sorts of technical things in here. Uh, we have uh, this section of Camozzi Road, as everybody's probably aware, is getting rebuilt. Uh, this section from here all the way to the far end will get rebuilt. We're working with Steve Black and his team on putting a, uh, a detached uh, multi-use path, uh, three meters wide paved, maintained for four seasons, disconnected from the, the, the vehicle travel lane all the way from, well, I mean, the city's also working on it all the way down to Nicole and all the way through to town. So we're looking to expand that pedestrian connection all the way through the resort. And as we develop neighborhoods like this one or this one, or up in here, we will look to connect those as, as, as uh, fingers off of that multi-use path system. That, that, those policies are sort of enshrined in the OCP. So as we get into detailed planning in each neighborhood or each subdivision, those are things that we'll have to be accounted for and managed at that time. Next slide, please. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about, about the original planning and the, and the bed units and, and how this all sort of worked out back in 2003. Now, prior to, prior to annexation, the, the mood of the day, and I, I don't have the benefit of history of being here, but the plan is pretty evident that this is a low density, single family predominant neighborhood. And this is sort of a buffer between that and, a, and basically a, a repeat of downtown over here. That was the concept of the day, is that Revelstoke Mountain Resort was going to be its own thing, separate, it's going to be its own, almost its own town, and Revelstoke was going to be over here. This is 2003 pre-annexation. Um, Post-annexation, plans like this change. Resort, get, the investments of the resort change, behaviors, socioeconomic factors around the world change, pandemics, high-speed internet, working from home, all sorts of things come in and things change. Um, but, uh, and, and with that, areas just outside the boundary, for example, um, you know, if you look at this area, this is Mackenzie Village. The entitlement currently at Mackenzie Village is 1,400 units. So times four, 50, what's that, 56? Mm -hmm. That's 5,600 bed units is entitled here. This is 63. So, that's that's a bit of a context for for to, to consider. Um, the other thing that's that's in the the master development agreement, and we were actually looking at it just before lunch, but um, there is some text in there. We couldn't find it, but the the resort had a requirement that it couldn't overbuild and become bigger than the town. And I think it relates to commercial size and commercial investment. Um, and I think that's a good thing, and that's something that we're, you know. We don't want to try and recreate downtown at the resort. Revelstoke has this amazing downtown with lots of independent businesses that create a great feel and a great, we just had lunch at the Taco Club. We want to, we want to be um, supportive and, and, and uh, we want to be an accessory and a, and a, and a uh, collaborative use rather than a imposing or a dominating use at the resort. Because that's what I think will drive our brand, guest experience here, people that want to live here. All of those things will be better if we do it that way. And that's so. So essentially, the 2003 map, uh, we have enough policy around it to meet those objectives. But the map, for example, we can all agree is probably nothing that we want to try and pursue. Things like driving ranges over ri rivers, things like that. Things that we never do in real in, in real time. Next, uh, next slide, please. Um, so this gets a little bit to the technical part of the, the reason for the um, committee, the whole delegation. Um, in the current zoning bylaw, the, there's a table that's divided by area, and then, unit, and then entitlement was granted to each area. Uh, from the research I've done, it, it seems like prior to Prior to the financial troubles in the in the in the recession, 
the partners at the resort brought their lands to the table and didn't bend the lands into the deal. They kept their land title. And so how that worked is, is they got entitlement for their piece of owned land as it related to the limited partnership of the resort. It wasn't actually controlled by one master developer. Um, but going forward, um, as we as we look at the uh, at the, the table and how to how to sort of do a little bit of housekeeping to, to keep it a little bit more in line with the OCP and in the uh, and the MDA, uh, we've we've asked for a, a, the ability to move thirty percent of the density out of the core, you know that sort of revillage concept that from the two thousand and three plan, and move it as a maximum of fifteen percent to any other parcel. So to so working with uh, with Mr. Simon for the last year, and um, if we if we took the 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 full maximum amount of density that could be moved out of the core and moved it to the lowest parcels, what would we end up with? And that would be these two parcels down here. So we would move from from you know uh, these numbers in here, and they're also in your in your in your staff package from from for later today. Uh, but uh, next slide, please. This, this is basically a, a, a table showing density by type in each area. So area one is the core. That's where they're sort of recreating that, you know, a new city center. Um, blue is commercial floor area. Uh, orange is hotel. A gray apartment row is, is yellow and single family is blue. If we took all of that 30%, that maximum you could take out of there and applied it to the two areas with the least, that's what the table would look like. That's how the balance of development would follow across the land if we did the most extreme amount of transfer. Now, I think there's going to be some commercial area transfer to a golf parcel for a snack shack. There's going to be, you know, things like that, 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 that the current zoning bylaw, as it's written, as that table in the zoning bylaw, not the bylaw itself, doesn't really contemplate. But it's well contemplated in every other piece of of, of applicable documentation. So this is just a, a table to demonstrate that a little bit. Uh, next slide. Um, before I go to this one, um, that was a lot of information. Um, does anybody have any questions? We can go back to any slides if anybody wants to. Just a quick question regarding the city owned property, property around Williamson Lake. Um, do you know what that kind of buffer, or what buffer that provides Williamson Lake? Um, I can get the dimensions for it. it it's, it's, do we want to go back to slide nine? Yeah, so, I mean, you could, you, these are from a survey map. Okay. So the, in scale, the colors are correct. So there's, this is big. I mean, this is half the width of the, of the city park. From, from high, from uh, high water to the, to the edge. This is a little bit thin, but I think this is because of a cliff and surveying half a cliff is difficult. Um, and there's also a creek that comes down through here and then sort of washes over. Um, Do you happen to know the name of that creek by chance? Oh, the one that goes down through the old spa site. Uh, Hayes. Hayes. Okay. Hayes A or B? It's Hayes. Hayes. <laughs> yeah, Hayes Creek. Yeah. Yeah, so that you can actually see the delineation of the creek. That's a survey of the creek done by a legal survey as well. Okay. So that some of the permitting with the province as it relates to the environment requires a, a, a biologist to set high water mark and a legal surveyor to survey the high water mark. That can't be done by a construction surveyor. It has to be done by two professionals associated to the to their associations. Yeah, if you're not familiar with the land on that side of the shore. It is, it's quite steep. Yeah, it's a cliff. <laughs> Follow up, Councilor? No, thank you, sir. Councilor Palmer? Uh, thank you, Mayor Souls, and uh, th thank you uh, to the team there for uh, bringing this. Um, certainly uh, appreciate it. And um, I thought I'd just mention uh, for those that might be watching this, um, the uh, you know why why this uh, committee the whole it was um, the previous this uh, the motion or, or uh, this addressing the uh, density shift was uh, looked at the previous council and uh, the previous council thought this should be uh, coming before the new council because it was right at the end of their term 
and uh, have a better understanding. And um, certainly this is a good start for that. Um, just a little bit of con So sorry, I couldn't be there in person. I really would have liked to have been there. Uh, it's a lot easier. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that's notable to me right away is I can't actually see where you're gesturing on the uh, slides. So uh, uh, it's a, a little bit difficult to follow, but I'm pretty familiar with the areas. Um, uh, so I, I have a sense of it. Uh, um, the uh, uh, a couple questions. So the the two two thousand you've re, a few of the slides you referred to two thousand and three um, entitlements. So were those in the um, the original master plan, or was that before, or was that in, were those entitlements included with the original master plan? Yeah, those are, excuse me, those entitlements are, are contemplated in the original master plan. When it was updated in 2005, the entitlements actually jumped to 16,600. Um, so there's slightly different planning densities around that. So with you, you, you're using the term we're anticipated. Were they actually in a plan or was that just some of the early, early work? Because I, I hadn't seen that before. So I'm just trying to get a sense of the, the history. Was it just some of the earlier discussions, the 2003 entitlements? That was part of the original plan that formed the basis for consultation that formed the master development agreement. Okay, so there were the ideas for the consultation, but weren't in the mass, they weren't in, entrenched in the master plan. So I think that's that, that actually brings up a, a, a bit of a question. And, and, and I think there's something that maybe Bill can help with. The picture isn't the plan, the policy is the plan. And I think there's a bit of, there's often a disconnect. There's not a review and approval of a picture. There's an approval of policy. And policy gives the developer the opportunity to go and do further due diligence, refinement, and, and digging, mostly around the environment and the geotechnical hazard and the hillside condition. Yeah. And then they can update the picture and come back. And at that point, it's subdivision application and development permit. Right. And that's when the city gets final review of a plan that they expect, they can expect to get executed. To think any of these drawings today will be executed as is, other than in concept, is 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 not is not typical and not how it happens. Quite honestly, I, I, I've worked on multiple master plan projects with different durations. They're all guided by policy, and that's the the conversation we're having is is policy. Follow up, Councilor Palmer. Uh, yeah. Um, so what what I'm trying to do is, uh, you know, the intent with the regional uh, council is you know, getting a better understanding of what's happening. Uh, so, um, you know, the the history and where we are. And um, I did look a little bit at the original um, some of the documentation. There was very, very, very extensive documentation uh, um, in the. Um, uh, that are at least appendices to the uh, um, original um, master development agreement. Um, just, just for clarity, you're saying that uh, the master development agreement does not have these uh, concept plans in? in no, chain. A, a master development agreement references a master plan that's subject to change. And uh, in the next section, actually, we'll probably get um, you know, Bill Hunter's here. You can't see him, but he's the you know the, the director of the Mountain Resorts Branch for the province. And uh, Kelly Northcott is a senior manager with the province. They they manage these sorts of things with local government in concert with local government around the province, and probably a little bit better to speak on that process. But no, you know, concepts that are used for the purpose they're illustrative ideas of what could happen if policy is in place. Right. What will happen is subject to working it out with people like like Steve Black and and and. And Paul Simon, and working it out with professionals, with biologists and, and hydrologists and geotechnical engineers and civil engineers, um, to, to, to get a plan for this amount of land that we knew would be executable would be millions and millions of dollars in years and time. What, what, what zoning and entitlement does is basically provides a, a security for for the process to go forward to do that due diligence to see what we can come back with. That's that's what this is really for. All right, thank you for that. Councilor Palmer, another follow-up? Uh, thank you, Mary Souls. Yeah, and just for clarity, um, I'm just trying to get an understanding and I certainly am well aware that 
every detail of uh, development wasn't anticipated uh, in this. And that includes why we have some of the density tables that were there originally, I believe. Uh, just uh, uh, notwithstanding your statements that, uh, that you know, these are just, um, I guess, illustrations. I'm not sure what your terms, but we are looking at pictures that which are very, very powerful for, uh, for the, the public and uh, for us uh, at the decision table as well. So um, I will refer to the, the, the plans that you've shown us. Uh, just the one that's on the, on the um, screen right now, uh, you were talking about uh, the red. I just specifically interested in Williamson Lake and the red uh, that you brought to our attention. Um, it shows, uh, uh, I, I think you described that it's either uh, already in city uh, jurisdiction or uh, there's uh, working towards that. So the, the, city, uh, the city park across from the Williamson, the, we have the Williamson Lake Park. I think everybody's very, very, yeah, right there. Thank you. That's, everybody's very familiar with that. Across the lake, directly across the lake. Is that, is that in title with the city right now? Or is that, did you say that was in uh, preliminary agreements? So, so that park across the fronts onto Camozzi and down to Williamson Lake has been long registered to, this, to the city and everything to the south. The little sliver to the north, the smallest of the four parcels per se, is the one that's pending the standing litigation. And that, that we, we don't have any mechanism to slow that up or to speed it up. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah, sure. and it's more, more for understanding. Now there's gaps in the red there, so it's not showing a complete circuit. Like people do walk along. Um, the, the blue along the lake is just a high, low water mark. That is yeah. a there. I, there. The lake shore is, is all dedicated to the city. Yeah, the, the the developers not retained any lake shore along that side uh, until it reaches the, uh, the the outflow, and then we've got uh, the parcel between there and the city lot um, that uh, that we've retained, and but we have a, a a trail agreement in principle with the city. So basically, the circumference of the lake is either in city entitlement or will be, other than that property that's directly across from where Williamson Lake campground is now, correct? Right. Yeah, so the, the stuff to the gray, that's owned by a private individual, actually J.S. Park, as far as yeah. I understand. Okay. Um, so that, that if, if the city wanted to get the entire circumference, uh, we, we still have some, we'd like to do some planning down on that land in the, in the bottom. Um, and we, you know, potentially like to have some access to the lake, but we recognize that the foreshore uh, would would have a, a trail with public access, right. and we've we've demonstrated that through through recent road dedication down there. So I mean, the city's got good access right to the edge. Councilor Palmer, do you have another question? Um, yeah. So and just on the uh, the golf course, so there's been interest in. Uh, I know there's not too going to be too much focus, but part of the reason for some of the shifts, if I'm understanding correctly, is uh, over time where the golf course ultimately is going has shifted from what was originally anticipated. Uh, and that's uh, one of the driving uh, factors, I believe for the, some of the shifting, is that, is that accurate? I, I wouldn't say so. I would say uh, the original, the, there's, there's definitely some property that was and wasn't owned uh, at time of, of, of annexation. I mean, at time of annexation, the ownership was different than it is today. Right. It went through a bankruptcy, um, and with that, not every parcel was vended into that limited partnership. And so this is why this ownership map makes sense. Now we get to see um, what is actually within the, with, within the, the parent developer's uh, purview. Uh, there's lands off to the north that the city's been contemplating applications on that was owned by one of the previous partners. There's a de development entitlements on that. And that's an example of how a partner brought some land to the table in exchange for some investment, got entitlement back. And that's really why the table's there, as far as I can tell. Um, and, you know, maybe, you know, Mr. Simon can help me, but I mean, we've, we've gone through this. I've never seen a table like this anywhere in any zone, in any municipality I've worked in Western Canada. It's, it's unique, it's interesting. So the history was something I wanted to kind of try and figure out. And it's, it's definitely not clear. But it wasn't, as far as I can tell, it was not to, 
to specifically in, influence land planning, more to in, influence development partners in an LP. Thank you. Yeah, uh, th uh, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Souls. Yeah, just in, on that, um, I, I guess, you know, to uh, the other counselors, that's one of the things that I'm sort of interested in is, uh, yes, it's unique. There's many, many things unique about uh, Revelstoke and including my understanding from some of the old timers, uh, how this annexation in the city uh, uh, was um, an important factor at the time to so that we didn't dilute the downtown. I think that was driven by my understanding anyway, from again, talking to some of the old timers, uh, that that was one of the unique protections that Revelstoke put in. So compared to say Kicking Horse, which is very distinct and uh, uh, disjointed from uh, Golden, I would suggest. Um, and so uh, understanding things like the table, when you know I see it and um, uh, I certainly not an expert in that area, whether you know density tables are, um, uh, common in other ski developments or not, um, it's certainly, uh, we do deal with density issues uh, in OCP and uh, zoning uh, all the time. That's a, one of the major things that we're dealing with that. And so for me to understand that, uh, is, you know, having an under, you know, understanding, uh, one thing that I would say from the little bit that I've looked at is that, you know, there was a lot of work in, in some very thoughtful process into that, uh, that original table and that's one of the things that I'm just trying to understand as the uh, request comes before us. Um, I, Mayor Souls, I think that's all I have from, for right now. Uh, there's more presentation do I understand. Yep. Any other questions from council before we move on? Councilor Cherry? Thanks very much. Just for clarification on uh, that map with the city owned or potentially city owned land uh, around Williamson Lake. Uh, I'm in here every day. I walk my dog there. Uh, is that everything below the bench? On the left hand side? No, so the bench is actually back here. You can see this height, this this sort of thick, that's actually contour lines. Okay. So the contours actually follow to about here. They go like that. Gotcha. So and you see this sort of, this is basically the slough. Yeah, it's the swamp area. Yeah, this is there. And then it goes into a bit of a creek. There's the weir, the underpass out into the Columbia. Um, no, there's a, there's a strip of land in here below the below the, uh, um, the escarpment. And then there's a, a chunk of land in here. Um, this is, uh, isn't that. Gotcha, just wanted to clarify that. But, but to, to expand on, on that, as we plan those lands, we will be looking at, at pedestrian connectivity through the civil section, like public roads, public trails, but also recreational trails. Uh, I mean, I've worked in golf anchored resorts and you have a, a, a homeowner survey and often the trails come out ahead of the golf course. You know, it's it's they're they're one of the cheapest amenities to build and the most valued asset in a community like this. Yeah, uh, just to follow up on that, uh, I think we've all received tons of questions and feedback prior to us being on council about, I guess, approaching you guys to save the uh, some of the un or not so well-known trail networks, both in the JS Park plan and the RMR land there, where you have those zones four and five. Uh, do you have any plans for that you can speak of? So yeah, later in the in the in the in the discussion deck, we have a bunch of stuff around community lands. Um, lighter on the land development, sometimes density and buildup, human buildup is the enemy of absorption and feel and value in a place. And in resort development, that's the thing we're trying to preserve is that experience. And so um, not saying that the trails that are there today will exist in their exact location, but I can confidently say that the connection through there, connection to wild places will be the same or better. And, and yeah, I mean, I've worked in other projects and that's exactly what we aim to do. And, and I think that's, uh, you'll see that or Planning department, anyway, we'll see that in our applications. There's the, the formal pedestrian network that you know paved and everything else, but then there's also the, the informal pedestrian network that's that's critical. All right, All right let's move on, Mr. Cullen. Okay. Yeah, um, Bill, do you want to take this next bit? Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we've got the controlled area. Uh, and uh, well, you know, 
Bill deals with these master development agreements, and, and I think you were you saw us through this one back um, in. The... I joined the province uh, 2005, 2006. So, so right at the time. So right at the time that the master development agreement was approved by the province, <laughs> uh, following a, a fairly extensive review process. Yeah. Yeah. So so this map just shows you know that this is not an uncommon thing. I don't know how many how many MDAs that you're administering. Thirteen. There, there you go. Yeah, throughout the province. Yeah. Yeah, and they're all they're all they all have similar um, similar language, similar intent, similar program. Yeah, uh, and first of all, just th thank you very much for uh, having Kelly and I here to to join in the conversation. We appreciate that. Um, we administer uh, master development agreements for major mountain resorts, as well as community ski areas throughout the province. Anything lift based uh, comes through our branch and we're located in Kamloops. Uh, we're now part of the Ministry of Tourism, Arts, Culture and Sport. Uh, we've just been transitioned over from Flynn Ward, the, the large ministry that uh, uh, disaggregated, <laughs> but the branch still has that function of administering master development agreements, um, conducting, facilitating major project review processes under our all seasons resort policy. And delivering downstream land and tenure land and timber authorizations uh, for resort operators and community ski areas to implement their master plan. So they, uh, you know, upon approval of a master plan and a master development agreement in this case, but for a community ski area, it's an operating agreement. Um, we deliver uh, cutting permits we, under the Forest Act. We deliver crown land tenures such as leases, licenses, statutory right of ways as well as crown grants for, for residential and commercial development within the, the approved master plans. Two slides ahead, please. I might step forward. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> two, yeah. Uh, again. No, uh, head, sorry. The other way. The other way, yeah. One more. One more, yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, so, Bill. <laughs> yeah, um, well, um, I might just uh, uh, speak to the the major project review process. You know the master plan that we we receive uh, as an initial submission often uh, is modified uh, through uh, the stages of a master a mas master plan major project review process, and that's based on the comments and input that we receive from local government, from stakeholders, uh, you know uh, legal interest holders. Uh, First Nations, we conduct uh, First Nation consultation and uh, our basic process is to identify uh, concerns, conflicts, uh, potential negative outcomes from a proposed development and work with the proponent and the, uh, the participants, local government, First Nations to uh, come up with uh, mitigating measures and that may mean changes to the master plan itself or conditions that get tied to the master development agreement. Um, so uh, I think I heard that uh, the initial master plan submission was around 15,000 bed units, and I think the final approved master plan contained 16,600 in this case, uh, and that was uh, following that review process that, that we undertook uh, almost two decades ago. And uh, what we receive, uh, you know, in the end is a, a master plan that's referenced in the master development agreement. And uh, the master development agreement recognizes that big total bed unit amount. And I think in this case, there was recognition of, of the city of Revelstoke and the resort not becoming a dominating entity. So it, it's actually got much more recreational capacity and a lower amount of bed units in this case than we see in other, other major resorts in the province. Um, but uh, the nature of a master plan is very much conceptual. Um, we, uh, we anticipate that the developer through time will, uh, will conduct various studies that are often uh, included as conditions in the MDA uh, or required by regulation. And uh, that that's going to inform the final engineering and, and uh, final design of any parcel or uh, development that's proposed within the master plan. So we expect there, there to be shifts. And we also recognize that it's, it's not the province's um, role to, uh, to dictate how the resort responds to, to uh, demand of market 
for real estate, for commercial real estate, for residential products. Um, and even on the mountain, we recognize that what may have been a fixed grip for a person chair may evolve into a, a gondola or a, or a six pack. So we recognize that there is a, a progression of information that's accumulated by developers over time. And that the final um, application that we receive is going to uh, include those refinements and, and shifts. And that could be, it could be a multifamily to single family. It could be um, uh, including a, a hotel in an area that is going to complement the skier services and final lift design, skier staging. So we understand that it's gonna morph over time. Um, but it's our job to make sure that uh, we're reviewing their application in uh, in consideration of all the legal conditions that are in the master development agreement, and that um, we're doing our, our bed unit uh, calculations to make sure that the uphill capacity, the recreational capacity of the mountain, um, is about is in balance with the uh, base area village. Uh, so that we never get um, the situation where the base area outstrips the, the recreational capacity of the mountain and creates a negative experience for skiers. Um, uh, we see Whistler Blackcomb uh, right now uh, kind of working through bottlenecks and implementation of their plan. So uh, we're mindful of uh, how it evolves and, uh, and recognize that the, the resort developer has that role to, to determine market and uh, those market priorities so that they're successful in the end uh, financially and, and creating a, a strong brand and ski experience. Right, thank you. Can we go to slide 18, please? Let's try and get through pretty, only a few minutes, so. Um, so we just wanna jump ahead to some of the things we're working on. We're continue, continuing to develop our brand and the quality of experience. Peter talked about adding lift capacity. We, we are gonna, if we start making some more investments up mountain, it's gonna be, it's gonna be amazing for, for the amount of skiers that we have. It, it's, it's great. Uh, we're looking at the resort to try and create a little bit more vibrancy around the resort. Again, complimentary to downtown. You'll see uh, an amendment at some point for the, what we call the Heli Hotel looking trying to put a pedestrian access to the Rockford Mac Tavern area, try and connect everything together with people on their feet rather than in cars or crossing car areas and, and trying to create some vibrancy there. Um, design some all season facilities. We've got golf coming, but you know, golf is a short season. So trying to look at some amenities uh, on the resort, um, start really working on parking and transit. Uh, you know, we've had some good conversations with uh, Mr. Parliament and his team about that. We want to continue that. Um, you know, there's interesting stats in the U.S. when you look at resort markets. Um, the most, the resort transit with the highest ridership is Aspen. Aspen is also the highest area of assessment value in the U.S. So a good quality transit system that works better than driving a car, doesn't matter how rich you are, you're going to take transit. And I think, you know, it's not, I think that's something we can aspire to here. Um, you know, working, you know, with the town, you know, mostly with our, 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 our work with town on things like uh, civil infrastructure improvements, rebuilding of Camozzi Road, we're adding a reservoir that will sort of balance into the, uh, into the city system, create another redundancy, but also service the resort. So working on those sorts of things. Um, in the OCP, there's a section around social impact study that was done as part of the annexation process. Obviously, there's been a couple of decades around. Uh, so there's some updating of that sort of study that needs to happen. RMR wants to be at the table for that sort of thing. There's a lot of a lot of impacts that have changed between then and now. Things like high speed internet, working from home, the 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 you know changes in the forestry, the, the hydro, the there's so many changes. So to try and capture that and how how do we work with the town, with the business community in town, with the hospitality community in the town. Um, so that, uh, I mean, we need them to provide those short-term rents so that we can get people up to the resort. So we, we just want to re-engage at the table on that side. Um, again, that's more stakeholder collaboration. And then uh, as we as we sort of unlock some of these policy roadblocks, well, this current policy roadblock we've got in front of council, then we can start moving towards uh, some of these planning processes and uh, 
we've got a, a phasing update that we would do with the province that would come back to local government as well and some public engagement process around that, but also development per permit and subdivision application. Um, next slide. Uh, where are we going? Next slide. Uh, we just could next slide. <laughs> um, so, you know, in the near term, we'd like to look at uh, this com community housing neighborhood. Um, this this uh, area in blue is sort of, we consider this sort of phase one resort. So that's North Village. So that's from the gondola line to the north um, and the golf course. So clubhouse for the golf course, some residential for the golf course, some residential, some golf amenity in here, and then uh, some community housing down in here. Uh, we, we would like to look at transit and, and airlift, potentially some amenities and some environmental reserves down in this area, things like that. Um, that's that's what we're that's how we're thinking about development as it goes forward at the village. Peter's obviously giving you an up mountain sort of overview as well. Uh, next slide. It's more of the same. It's less bubbles around it. Um, we've got new gondola, hotel opportunities in the resort. Um, you can see there's been a hotel explosion in town. We'd like to get a few more people staying at the resort. Um, we're happy to have those short term rents in town. Um, uh, and by short term rents, I mean hotels. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, skier services and then the community housing neighborhood. Caveat, we don't own this piece on the end, but we do have permission from the landowner to, to look at that and try and engage it. She's interested in community housing right. as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we, we, we included this. Again, this is an example of, of concepts that, you know, with you use a policy and then you develop concepts. The iterations, the pictures can be, there's almost no end to it. So it's, uh, you can sort of see that this, we call this the Cabot lands. This is the, the new Heli Hotel under construction. This is a Sutton. You know, if we look at this area to the north, we could do something like this, parking down in here. Maybe we move parking in here. You know, this one has a spa concept in here. You know, we have to do market studies. We have to do geotechnical analysis. And, and that's the sort of stuff that we'd like to get excited about. Next slide. Oh, there we go. So this one is, uh, we, we actually had our, our planner <laughs> have a look at this lower land. So this is that escarpment. This is that, the old gravel pits right here. Um, so you sort of look at, this is higher density housing number of different iterations of different types. We'd have to do more studies around uh, what we would build and retain for rent, what we would sell to the market, what we would what would we try and put deed restrictions on in terms of occupancy. Um, the one thing I would say about this land down here is that we would we would we would deed restrict that to not have short term rental. We're not interested in creating another hotel zone down in our community housing area. So that would be that that 30 day minimum. Or we're, we'll end up probably retaining a bunch of it for rental, right. uh, or or deed restricting it to, uh, to to a resident. We need housing as we grow this resort for for you know as we add hotels. We need general managers for those hotels. We need food and beverage managers. We need chefs. We need every, any number of these these professionals. And uh, housing in Revelstoke's a challenge. Uh, next slide, please. We've actually done a little bit of studying around this. Um, these these ones up here up are more on the top, but these are these are examples in other mountain towns around the U.S. Whitefish, Breckenridge, um, other towns of similar size to uh, to Revelstoke, so Jackson Hole, and so we're sort of next slide, please. So we've sort of looked at yeah here's here's one big sky, you know, see planning Wellington and Bre Breckenridge. All of these are resident housing in those resort towns. So this is something we'd look like to look at as part of this this process is is it's actually the lowest hanging fruit for us. Right. It's flat land. It's down below. It has less geotechnical constraints. It's sat, it's fronted by road on two sides. It's 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 pretty quick stuff that we can could move forward. And all of these towns are about the same size as uh, as Revelstoke and experiencing the same housing challenges of Revelstoke. Next slide. That's it. We try to get it done in time. I wanted to have a few minutes for questions, but I might be out of time. Well, just uh, just before we uh, go into the council meeting, so um, we, we have that text amendment in the council meeting. Are you going to stick around in case yeah. we have questions? I will, yeah. 
And again, that, that text amendment, just as from my perspective, and, 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 uh, and Paul will have more color on this, but the, the hierarchy of, of documents really goes, you know, uh, uh, regional growth strategy, OCP, then zoning. Um, and, and oftentimes, well, there's actually, you know, that the province is trying to allow municipalities the tools to adopt zoning bylaws that are in keeping with the OCP yeah. with minimum process, because that's that's recognizing the hierarchy of, of how this all works. We are we are it's not a perfect zoning bylaw. We're working with staff um, to in the long term. We would like to do an update, full council engagement and and the public engagement around updating uh, the CD8 zone and the zoning bylaw associated with it. Uh, these master plan communities typically have their own section in the OCP. Uh, because they're intended to be act outside of what is right for main town or, or some industrial district. They're, they're meant to act on their own. Uh, the OCP is actually in pretty good shape for the CD8 zone. Uh, the zoning bylaw could use some help, but uh, it's a long-term effort. And, and in time, uh, we look forward to doing that. But uh, we've got some investments we'd like to make on a mountain, and we've got some uh, housing we'd like to deliver to the market. For sure. All right. Thank you. Any Thanks. other questions from council? Seeing none. Uh, Councillor Palmer, well, you have a question before I shut it down? Yeah, uh, it's a bit uh, a bit rushed here. Um, I definitely have lots of questions, uh, but because we have a council meeting, probably don't have time for that. Uh, I would like to say thank you very much. There is some music to my ears as far as uh, transit. Um, uh, I do have some detail, sort of more detailed questions, I guess, more for council uh, when we get into the regular meeting, but I have a number of unanswered questions at this moment. Thanks. Councilor Palmer. All right, Council, I'm gonna ask for a motion to adjourn the uh, Committee of the Whole, and we'll take a five minute break uh, before we go into regular Council. Moved by Councilor Lucio, seconded by Councilor Devlin. All in favor? Motion's